Cats and dogs truly are sleeping together. Indy cars at Charlotte. It's something that we never thought we'd hear again, at least in an officially sanctioned event uh, since the tragedy in 1999 in which a tire went into the stands, killed a few people, and the PR nightmare that ensued. Uh, a war of words throughout the media uh, between Charlotte Motor Speedway and the Indy Racing League at the time. Uh, you know, we just thought it was never, ever going to happen. And yet, here we are sitting right now uh, in current year as Joseph Newgarden has lapped the Roval Charlotte Motor Speedway on a NASCAR weekend in an IndyCar. Um, so we're going to talk all about this. We're going to talk all about the doubleheader stuff, but this is This Week in Racing, so I've got many other things to talk about, which we are going to talk about right now. Let's start off with some Formula One. And this is a pretty big news story that broke just uh, just a couple of hours ago uh, that McLaren will be switching from the Renault engine in 2021 back to Mercedes. Now, M McLaren's most fruitful years really were, were seen with Mercedes engines and they switched in 2014 uh, to the Honda power unit in 2015 and we know of course how that went uh, eventually leading to them dumping the engine uh, in pretty uh, public uh, in a pretty public way and uh, going to the Renault engine. Uh, Honda never really mended their bridges with McLaren or Fernando Alonso. We've talked about that quite a bit. Uh, but of course, we know that Mercedes is the strongest power unit on the grid for Formula One. And with the resurgence we've seen from McLaren this season, you think with two more years of development plus the best engine in Formula One, uh, this very well could become a true title contender once again. Speaking of Formula One, there continues to be quite a bit of talk about potentially doing reverse grid races in qualifying for Formula One uh, next season. Now, this has been, uh, has had a mixed uh, review, I guess you could say, from teams, fans, owners alike. Um, it seems like they are pressing forward on this, Formula One is, and I have to say just an opinion here that uh, Formula One really should focus on its core product first and improving that before they start trying to add any more gimmicks to the product to try to cover up some things that maybe the rules makers have written into the rules that make the racing worse from a car design standpoint rather than just trying to artificially create passing and overtaking because you put the fast cars behind the slow ones. And in the world of NASCAR, a huge bombshell broke in that Ricky Stenhouse Jr. will not return to Roush Racing in the 17 for the 2020 season, and he will be replaced by Chris Busher because Roush had an option on Busher's contract that was buried deep down inside, and Jack decided to make that switch. Stenhouse now is one of the most uh, highly sought after free agents on the market right now, uh, but it's going to be kind of touch and go exactly where he's going to end up for next year. Now, um, thinking about this, I, I have to. I have to feel that the exact moment where this decision was made by Jack Roush, I mean, think about this, at the Richmond race, uh, where you had Ryan Newman, the teammate, of course, to Ricky Stenhouse, in the playoffs, racing for the lead, uh, and definitely performing much higher than I think the team or that car is capable of, theoretically. Uh, so you have a driver that's really overperforming. Ricky Stenhouse wasn't having a great race. I think he was kind of battling to, to stay on the lead lap the entire race. And then you had the moment which I think changed his career. Uh, he had a contact with the leader of the race, Martin Truex Jr., wrecked him, somehow managed to not take him out of the race. Of course, Martin Truex went on to win the race, but I think the damage was done. I think Jack Roush at that point looked at all of the things that have happened with Ricky Stenhouse uh, over the last few years and, and looked at this situation where you have uh, one car, one of your team cars up front, and one of them wrecking the leader <laughs> that is not for position in the first place. Um so there's definitely some possibilities now for NASCAR silly season. Um, a lot of people are talking about possibly uh, Stenhouse moving to the 37. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Daniel Hemrick uh, will move to that car at JTD, uh, JTG Darty. I've struggled with that since the Spin Master days. Um, but, I, you know, I always feel like Stenhouse, or I think Stenhouse is going to be the best fit in terms of a NASCAR uh, drive. I think, he, I mean, he just feels like a front row rate, uh, motorsports driver, right? It's a Ford, it's still Roush equipment, and generally speaking, that team shines on the plate tracks. Guess what Ricky Stenhouse generally shines in? Plate tracks. 
so I think that's the best fit. Will it happen? Maybe, maybe not. I, I would lean toward uh, more yes on this one, especially because David Reagan just retired. And, and David Reagan, if you think about it, really has had a very similar career path to Ricky Stenhouse Jr. So if they're going to hire a driver, they're going to bring a driver in. I think Ricky Stenhouse at Front Row Motorsports is there. And I think Daniel Hemrick will get a second shot in the 37 car. Unfortunately, you know, as we know, JT Chi Doherty Racing isn't exactly a front running team. They're not a back marker by any stretch of the imagination. I would say solidly mid pack. And so that's part of the reason I think some people were surprised that Jack would make the, the move for Busher uh, because he hasn't really shown all that much since moving to that team. But I would point out that that team really isn't capable of truly running up front, even to the point of what we've seen with Roush. I don't think they're quite capable of that. We saw some stuff with A.J. Allmendinger on some short tracks and road courses where the driver really matters. Um, but outside of that, we haven't seen that. So I think Chris Busher is a good choice for that 17 car. It's going to be fun to see what he can do at Roush Racing for next year. And finally, this is the big news. Joseph Newgarden, just minutes ago as I'm recording this, uh, did some demonstration laps in an Indy car at Charlotte Motor Speedway on the Roval on a NASCAR weekend. His lap times were around a 1 minute 7, and they were falling steadily as he was continuing to get more acclimatized to the track. This was literally a one-and-done run. He got no practice, uh, and it was some 13 seconds faster than the pole-winning cup time of William Byron. And so I think, you know... A lot of people will be very excited and, and interested in the fact that, yes, Joseph Newgarden made laps of Charlotte Motor Speedway. Yes, it's a pretty big milestone that this was more or less officially sanctioned laps at a track where, at one point, Humpy Wheeler said, the Indy cars will never be back here in any form. It's kind of cool to see cooler heads prevail. Um, but I think this whole charade, um, which currently is being talked about officially as a sponsor thing uh, with Shell, Shell made this happen. Um, but let's read between the lines here, and, and let's not even read between the lines. Let's hear what Dale Jr. had to say on NBC, which is that uh, uh, Marcus Smith, who owns the track now uh, and is the manager at, at Charlotte Motor Speedway, uh, was uh, very much looking at this as a possibility for a race in the future uh, for Indy cars on the Roval. So I think now's the time to talk about a doubleheader between IndyCar and NASCAR. And I have made, I have been very silent on this issue because quite frankly, prior to all this stuff kind of happening with the Roval, I was very, very skeptical. I didn't think it was a great idea. I thought either one product or the other would overshadow it. What market could you do it in that would kind of be neutral, a neutral space where, um, you know, you wouldn't have Kind of, what you don't want to do here, I think, is, is create some sort of a situation where it's like a, a you know, fan base is colliding uh, in some sort of a negative light. That's why you probably you could never do it at Indianapolis, and you probably couldn't do it at Daytona. But looking at the opportunities that the Roval presents, especially because it really it almost is a blend of of three different style circuits. You have the the super speedway, you have uh, a street circuit with lined with concrete walls, and you have a road course. So this is kind of what my thought process has kind of led to, especially because um, the IndyCar season tends to end pretty early and the Roval usually comes more or less a couple of weeks after the IndyCar season ends. It actually happened the week after the IndyCar season ends uh, this time, but that's not going to be the case in the future uh, with some of the NASCAR schedule changes. So this is what I propose. This is my doubleheader proposal. You can take it or leave it. I've already said it on Twitter, but of course I have like several thousand more followers on YouTube. Uh, so this is my idea. So I would turn Charlotte Motor Speedway into the all-star track. Of course, we know that NASCAR has their all-star event in the month of May uh, leading up to the Coke 600. My proposal is that for a doubleheader weekend with IndyCar and NASCAR together, um, you would do the... Roval playoff race for NASCAR, obviously. That's that's the slam dunk that's already going on. Uh, but the other thing you do is an IndyCar all-star race. And this would be the format that I would use. So the, the all-star race would take place the morning of uh, the Cup Series race. Uh, so you'd have qualifying uh, the day before on Saturday, uh, right before the Xfinity Series race. Uh, so you give fans a taste both days of IndyCar racing and of NASCAR racing um, and make it a truly integrated weekend. 
What would also work significantly well with the two events being back to back is that you can work with your TV partner, uh, which is common for both NASCAR and IndyCar in the late season with NBC. You could put the whole block on t on TV. You could start at noon with the IndyCar All Star Race, have a short pre race for the NASCAR Cup race, and then run that all on network NBC right before the six o'clock news. I think that would be. I think it's a slam dunk TV wise. Obviously you'd have to pitch it to the executives and the executives would have to say, yes, that's a good idea. But I think with the commitment now NBC has made to motorsport, I feel like it would be an easier pitch than you would think. So this is what my race format would be. So I would have the top 10 in IndyCar points would get an automatic invite to this event. Um, I wouldn't want it to be a full grid, especially because some of the backmarking IndyCar teams aren't necessarily you know, financially stable enough to be able to say, we'll pencil in an exhibition event. But if you consider that the top 10 in IndyCar points generally contain three Penske's, three Andretti's, and, and two Ganassi's, there's a lot of money there that, uh, that theoretically can enter cars. So you got the top 10 in points. And I would also open it up uh, to kind of continue this integration concept uh, by to also try to have one uh, or two uh, uh, wild card entries. Uh, now they could range from anybody, but I would, you know, if I'm booking it, uh, I would try to get a Formula One driver, current or maybe slightly former. You know, obviously a Fernando Alonso would be a pretty easy guy to to make a call to and say, hey, you want to come race for some money? And uh, he would either say yes or no. And the other car, the other wild card entry, I would definitely try to get a NASCAR driver, whether it's current, whether he was doing a, a the double at Charlotte. Uh, I think Jimmy Johnson would be a perfect candidate for something like this as a wild card entry. Uh, Jimmy's talked about wanting to do IndyCar racing. He's talked about the fact that he really would prefer to do a, a road course. Uh, and if it's an all-star race, it's a low pressure scenario and he doesn't have to worry about, uh, he can go for it. In other words, he wouldn't have to worry about, uh, ruining someone's championship. It's an all-star event. It's an exhibition. Um, and that would the same would go for a, a Formula One driver if you get them, whether it's uh, Fernando Alonso or, you know, if I'm really thinking big picture, I would be calling Lewis Hamilton or uh, Charles Leclerc or Max Verstappen trying to get a, a big name, try to generate a lot of, of press and excitement for this sort of a race. Uh, so I would do the race in three segments. And you may say, David, that sounds like stage racing. And I would say, yeah, it pretty much is. But thankfully, an all-star race is a gimmick race. And, you know, if you're going to do Indy cars in front of a NASCAR crowd, maybe you want to gimmick the race up a little bit. Again, it's an all-star race. So you would have a 10-lap uh, segment after qualifying on Saturday. The grid would be set by the lap times. Very simple. Uh, you would run 10 laps, a 10-lap sprint, and then you'd bring the cars into the pits and flip the grid, do a reverse grid, just like I was talking about in Formula One. Uh, so the, the cars at the back of the field would now go to the front. You would have a 15-lap heat, and then the way the cars finish that event would be how they would qualify for the feature event, uh, which would be 20 laps. And at the end of the day, winner takes, I don't know, half a million dollars home, uh, something like that. Maybe have a mandatory pit stop, some cool stuff. And again, this would take place on the morning of the cup race. So hopefully you'd have a huge crowd already uh, excited and rowdy for it. Uh, and then you go right into a, a cup race as well. Um, this is my idea. <laughs> you IndyCar, NASCAR, you're welcome to steal it. Um, but I would appreciate some some royalties. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe some free ticket. Maybe a press pass. Press pass. Uh, but anyway, um, I think this. I I think it could work. I think if it's an all star event, um, it's low pressure from the perspective of you know you 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 don't have kind of that. Oh well, is the IndyCar race going to overshadow the NASCAR race, or is this NASCAR event? It, say, if you made it the Roval, the IndyCar finale, you definitely have a, a question. Oh God, is the NASCAR race going to overshadow this? And doing them both on Sunday, I think I, I would hope that that the ticket people, the people making the, the you know those decisions, would not force uh, the events to be on separate days because I think that would be a mistake. I think it would it would. Uh, uh, defeat the purpose of having it be a double header. Maybe bring the Indy Lights too, <laughs> just to have that synergy along with the Xfinity series. There's a lot of interesting possibilities here. This is just one of them. I don't, again, I don't know if you could ha you could make it a standalone race unless it was truly standalone. Um, but again, I think an all-star race is the way I would do it. But again, the comment section is open and ready for you to fire away down below if you don't agree with me. If, if you don't feel like NASCAR and IndyCar should have a doubleheader at all, I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, 
this is fun. I think this could be, this has some potential to be really cool. I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, they couldn't do it next year. Um, not because there's any clash of conflict with IndyCar and NASCAR, but Petit Le Mans does take place on the same weekend as the Roval next year. And many of the IndyCar teams and drivers have commitments to run there. But then again, IMSA is owned by NASCAR. So maybe they could do this as early as next year, but I think you're looking at 2021. So what do you want to see in 2021? NASCAR, IndyCar, doubleheader, Roval, not Roval? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube, and I will see you 